So finally, we want to look at something that is a supersaturated solution. Supersaturated solutions have more solute than they normally can have at that temperature. Uh, uh, so you, you can get more of that compound dissolved in your solution than is normally possible. Uh, and so this is, uh, this is sodium acetate. This is a picture of what sodium acetate over on the left. We have a super saturated solution of sodium acetate. There's more sodium acetate present in there than we normally could get. Uh, if we put a seed crystal in, and that's what's going on here. They put a seed crystal in with that seed crystal. Uh, uh, we'll start to see the uh, uh, we'll start to see crystals form very, very quickly uh, to get from here over to here. It's like 20 seconds and getting over here is like another minute. Uh, it, it goes very, very quickly when we when we do this. You can e you don't even necessarily need a seed crystal. You can use a, a rough edge uh, if you have if you um, if you just touch it with your finger. This particular reaction will start. Um, you can also take a rough edge of glass and that will also give you uh, it will also give you the same thing occurring all right so i've got a video example of a super saturated sodium acetate solution and i'm going to put that up on the screen so i've already brought it up so that we don't have to uh, do this so i'm going to click on it and there's there's audio for it but it's not very exciting so here so they drop the crystal in and you can see right away that there's crystals that are forming and this is this is like a um, not time lapse this is about how fast it goes all right and so you can see those crystals forming very very quickly so this is a really fun reaction it's actually one that we do in lab so i really enjoy this one all right So now uh, uh, we're going to go back. So that is a super saturated solution. Um, there are lots of other videos about super saturated sodium acetate solutions, how to make it. It's, it's a really fun, it's a really fun process to do. All right. So let's look at number 19. So here's number 19 on our in-class assignment. And for this one, um, it says the solubility of, of chromium 3 nitrate nonahydrate in water is 208 grams per 100 grams of water at 15 degrees Celsius. A solution of the chromium 3 nitrate nonahydrate in water at 35 degrees Celsius is formed by dissolving 324 grams in 100 grams of water. Uh, when the solution is slowly cooled to 15 degrees Celsius, no precipitate forms. All right, so not surprisingly, this is a super saturated solution. Uh, the key to forming a super saturated solution, the way that you form it, super saturated solution, the way that you form a super saturated solution is uh, that you you first increase the temperature of the solution and you get more of your solute to dissolve at a higher temperature because here we've gone from 15 up to 35 degrees Celsius. You'll see that the solubility went up pretty substantially and then you gradually let it cool back down. And when you gradually let it cool back down, um, uh, what you'll observe is uh, uh, what you'll observe is that a um, no precipitate will form. And the reason no precipitate forms is that there's no seed crystal there to make it happen. So, uh, so that, that is, um, that is why, uh, we don't get a precipitate to form. So it's sort of in a meta stable condition. So what action might you take to initiate crystallization? Use molecular level processes to explain how your suggested procedure might work. Well, you can add a seed crystal. And when you add a seed crystal, what that does is it provides a location for the crystallization to start to occur. 
So by adding a seed crystal, you can get that crystallization to start to occur. All right. All right. Yes. And for, uh, I guess for the molecular level process is, uh, uh, it provides a location for crystallization to occur. All right, so now what we want to do is we want to look at the factors that affect solubility. These factors that affect solubility are going to be the strength of the solute-solute interaction, solute-solvent interactions, uh, pressure, and this is only going to work for gas phase uh, solutions, and uh, temperature. All right, so uh, uh, solute, solvent, pressure, and temperature. And so we'll go ahead and look at those. So we're going to look at the strength of the intermolecular forces we'll find that there, there's this rule that we like to use in chemistry, which is like dissolves like. And what that means is that if you've got uh, uh, similar compounds, so uh, uh, nonpolar, nonpolar solvents will tend to dissolve nonpolar solutes. Likewise, polar solvents will tend to dissolve nonpolar solutes. I said those backwards, but I said the same thing there. So, Polar dissolves polar, and nonpolar dissolves nonpolar. If we look at this table, this is a good demonstration of this. Over here on the left, we've got uh, these different solutions, these different alcohols, methanol, ethanol, propanol, butanol, pentanol, hexanol. And you'll see that as we go down that list, all we're doing is adding more carbon. Well, in the first molecule, half of the molecule is OH, which means it's going to be very good at hydrogen bonding. But as we go down, only about a third of the molecule is OH and ethanol, a fourth of it in propanol, a fifth of it in butanol. You get the idea. So a smaller proportion of the molecule is actually made out of OH. Well, water interacts with that OH really, really well. So for these smaller molecules, they dissolve in water quite freely. As we go down the list, uh, we get down to butanol, it's not quite so freely. Now, the units here are moles per 100 grams of solvent. So, uh, 0.11 moles per 100 grams of solvent is still quite a bit. Uh, but it is, if you add enough of this butanol, you're going to get a, um, you're going to get a, a, a phase change. You'll, you'll get two liquids uh, that, are not, that are not miscible with each other. Um, and the word miscible, and uh, uh, we'll talk about this here in just a second, the word miscible just means that two liquids will dissolve in each other. All right, and, uh, and so as that nonpolar component gets bigger, it gets less soluble. Over here, we've got hexane. Hexane is a nonpolar solvent, and we will find that Methanol is not completely soluble in hexane, and so we will get uh, uh, we will get a phase uh, separation. So we will get uh, uh, a liquid on a liquid. Um, what what it looks like when you get that phase separation is uh, uh, kind of like what it looks like when you mix oil and water. So you'll get uh, you'll get a boundary between the oil and the water. Here you'll get a boundary between the methanol and the hexane. But you'll notice that all of the other ones are quite soluble. And that's because as the, as the alcohol gets less polar, it dissolves uh, much easier. You'll notice that ethanol and propanol are really good at dissolving both of these are dissolving in both of these. And the reason for that, the reason that we don't have like an overlap here, like where this and this uh, are both insoluble or we get low solubility is because of that entropy factor. It's not all about delta H. The entropy means that there are some things that are gonna dissolve in both uh, water and uh, hexane. 
So here, this is the process that occurs. Uh, we get these similar interactions. Uh, um, so ethanol molecules, they interact uh, with hydrogen bonding, very strong interactions. But ethanol also has a very strong interaction with water. So when it comes to biological systems, um, and here I've got two biological, uh, uh, I've got two um, uh, vitamins, uh, vitamin A and vitamin C. Vitamin A, as you can see, when you look at the uh, when you look at the structure here, we've got all these carbon-carbon and carbon-hydrogen bonds, and these are all nonpolar. So uh, vitamin A is not is not a polar compound. Uh, we do have this little OH at the end that's a little bit polar, but that really doesn't do a whole lot. This, if we put vitamin A into water, we're going to get an oily layer on top of the water. As a consequence, that means that vitamin A, when it gets in your body, is not stored in the aqueous parts of your body. It's stored in the fats of your body. It also means that when your body processes it, um, uh, well, it can store it in fats, but when your body processes it, it has to process it through the liver. If, uh, if your liver is not working correctly, then you'll get excess vitamin A and uh, you will get a condition that's called jaundice because you'll start to get a yellow color to your skin because you're not able to get all of the vitamin A, among other things, out of your body. Um, on the other hand, we have things like vitamin C. Well, vitamin C, you can see all these OHs and these oxygens, it's got hydrogen bonding capability all over the place. Vitamin C is quite soluble in water. If you get too much vitamin C in your body, no problem. Your body can eliminate that through your urine. Um, that also means that you have to have a constant supply of vitamin C. If you don't get a constant supply of vitamin C, uh, you, will get, uh, uh, you will get sick. You'll get rickets. No, not rickets. Scurvy. Uh, you'll get rickets if you don't get the vitamin A. So, uh, so yeah, with a vitamin C, uh, uh, you have to have a constant supply in your diet. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean you have to have it every single day, but it does mean that you need, um, you, you can't go months without it. So, fortunately, uh, in our modern world, uh, we usually have access to these vitamins in great abundance. All right. So again, to emphasize the polar versus nonpolar, uh, um, over here, here we've got what it looks like when uh, we get a, a separation uh, of immiscible liquids. So these two liquids are not miscible. Hexane is less dense than water. So we'll find that the hexane floats on the top and the water um, is down here on the bottom. Um, and so uh, we'll find that if we take, this is cyclohexane, which is related to hexane, but the cyclohexane, cyclohexane is, um, is not water soluble. And so it would form a, uh, it would form a, la a two layer mixture like this. Whereas some, a structure that's quite similar that has about this, it has the same number of carbons and hydrogens, but it has all these OHs on it. Because it has all of those OHs, uh, it ends up being quite soluble in water. So we'll find that this one can dissolve quite easily in uh, uh, quite easily in water. So insoluble in water for the hexane, cyclohexane, and soluble in water for uh, for glucose. So we want to look at number twenty-eight. So down here, we've got number 28. Um, indicate which of the following in each pair is likely to be more soluble in water. Explain uh, in each case. All right, some of these are really, really easy, and other ones take a little bit more effort. Uh, for this first one, for hexane, hexane uh, versus hexane diol. And you can tell right away, the one that's going to be more soluble in water is going to be the hexane diol. And that's because it's got these OHs. So, hexane diol is capable of hydrogen bonding. And I'm just going to put H bonding. All right, so hexane diol there. 
All right, on the next one, this one's a little tricky because both of these are going to have some solubility in water. Uh, pentanoic acid, it's got this polar part at the end and that's gonna make it a little bit soluble in water. Whereas sodium pentanoate, which is the conjugate base, we'll talk about conjugate bases in chapter 16. Uh, uh, sodium pentanoate is an ionic compound. Well, if you've got two things that are the same size and one is polar and one is ionic, we'll usually find that the ionic is more soluble. The reason for that is that when this dissolves, it dissociates. And when it dissociates, we're going to get, uh, when it dissociates, we are going to get more, uh, uh, we're going to get an, uh, a bigger increase in the entropy. So, so sodium pentanoate, is more soluble because it is ionic and dissociates. All right, uh, for this next one, very similar. Uh, we've got HCl, which is quite polar, and uh, an ethyl chloride, which is also fairly polar. However, we'll find that the HCl is a strong acid. And so because it is an acid, it dissociates. Because it's a strong acid, it dissociates. Uh, so we'll find that the HCl is going to be much more soluble than the ethyl chloride. Ethyl chloride is not capable of dissociating. So, so HCl is a strong acid. and is capable of dissociation. All right, finally, we've got ethylamine versus hexylamine. This is uh, directly related to that example that I showed you earlier with the different alcohols. As we get the longer carbon chain, it gets less soluble. So the one with the shorter carbon chain is going to be more soluble. So ethylamine will be more soluble than hexylamine. Uh, and so, so uh, CH3, CH2, NH2 has a shorter non-polar um, carbon chain. Right. All right. So we want to look at a few more things about uh, uh, about solutions. Uh, we're going to look at um, the effect of pressure on uh, solubility. Uh, before we do that, I will point out if we look at just, if we look at these liquids here. Or I'm sorry, we look at these gases and their solubility in water. We will find that uh, smaller molecules tend to be less soluble in water. If we ignore things like polarity, uh, uh, smaller molecules tend to be less soluble in water and larger molecules tend to be more soluble. And the reason for that is that the larger molecules have stronger dispersion forces. Now, that's definitely not universally true because... Uh, there, there's some other factors that go on there, but, um, but larger molecules in general tend to be more soluble. And you'll see that the solubility is still quite low on these things. Now, one more thing, or the next thing, is we want to look at something that we call Henry's Law. Um, we're not going to do any math problems with Henry's Law. We're simply going to, um, we're simply going to talk about it and, uh, and, what it says is that the solubility of a gas in a liquid is directly proportional to the partial pressure of that gas in that liquid. So um, our partial pressure of that gas over that liquid. So that means that uh, as you increase the partial pressure of the gas over the liquid, you increase its solubility. And as I mentioned, it's a direct linear relationship. 
and then here this is the equation again we're not going to do the equation uh, but that's the solubility of the gas k is a henry constant for that gas and that solvent and then the pressure is the partial pressure of the gas above the liquid now what i mean by this if we if we look uh, if we look at this particular bottle, this is just like some seltzer water, and um, the seltzer water has uh, uh, carbon dioxide dissolved in it, and the way that they get all that carbon dioxide to dissolve is one, they lower the temperature, and they bubble lots of carbon dioxide through, but then right before they package it, they make sure that the headspace here is filled with carbon dioxide. One of the reasons that they have that little bit of extra space, one, so it doesn't spill when you open it, but also so that they can displace any oxygen that's in there with carbon dioxide. By doing that, they increase the partial pressure of the carbon dioxide and make it so that uh, um, make it so that uh, um, the carbon dioxide is going to be more soluble. As soon as you open that lid. As, as this person seems to be doing here, as soon as you open that, um, that, that bottle cap, you will find that the carbon dioxide starts to leak out, and now you're going to have bubbles that come out of your seltzer water. So that's Henry's Law. Again, we're not going to do the math on it. You just need to know that as you increase the partial pressure of a gas above uh, a liquid, then that gas gets more soluble. As far as temperature goes, as you increase the temperature, uh, uh, as you increase the temperature of a solution, um, solids and liquids will get more soluble. Generally speaking, so generally speaking, as you increase the temperature, uh, um, solids and liquids will get more soluble. All right, and so you'll notice it's true for all of these. Now, there are some cases where that's not true for this cerium 3 sulfate. That's not the case. If you're curious as to why that is, look up cerium sulfate. Uh, uh, go Google that, and you will find out why that one gets less soluble as you increase the temperature. All right, for gases, it's the opposite. When you increase the temperature, the solubility of a gas will decrease. So as we increase the temperature, the solubility of a gas will decrease. Um, these are all cases here. We've got uh, methane, oxygen, carbon monoxide, and um, helium. Uh, there's, there's a couple of cases in which this is important for your everyday life. First one, going back to sodas. If you've got uh, a, a soda, uh, like a Coca-Cola or seltzer water or whatever, if you want it to stay bubbly, the best way for it to stay bubbly is to keep it in the refrigerator. Um, in the refrigerator, uh, uh, those bubbles will stay in solution longer. So, uh, so decreasing the temperature um, is quite beneficial. The other place that this will have an impact is with oxygen. Um, if you've got a lake, uh, uh, let's say you go out to one of our local lakes, um, you will find that at lower temperatures, more oxygen will dissolve. If the temperature of the lake gets really high, less oxygen will dissolve. Well, that's a real problem because most lakes have fish in them. If the if there's lots of oxygen dissolved in uh, if there's lots of oxygen dissolved in the water, then the fish are going to be quite healthy. But if uh, the temperature of the lake gets too high, there's less oxygen in the water, and that could cause uh, some of the fish to die. So um, this is a problem when lake levels get really, really low, uh, particularly when we have a drought. Fortunately, we haven't had a drought this year, uh, but, uh, but whenever we have a drought, um, that, that becomes a big problem. All right, let's see what the next thing. All right, so the next part I'm going to put on the next video. Um, so I will stop this.